Hello everybody, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club, and I'm very happy to finally introduce uh, our conference, uh, Evicted by Greed, Global Finance, Housing and Resistance. That is a conference that we have been preparing since many months now, and we are finally able to make it uh, after a long time of production. <laughs> and uh, I'm also happy to uh, thank uh, uh, the other uh, members of the team of the Disruption Network Club, uh, Lieke Plucher, that is the co-director of the lab, together with me, that is also on the room close uh, to mine and will be also live uh, in a few seconds. Elena Velianoska and Ada Bakker that work on the production, Jonas Franchi on the graphic, Steph Lenk on the communication, and Ranav Adikari on the streaming. So I'm uh, finally very happy to introduce the first day of this conference uh, that uh, will go on until uh, the evening of Sunday. And uh, the topic of the conference, as the title already says, is how real estate investors use strategic loopholes to disrupt housing, not only in Germany, but also worldwide. Uh, this conference is a follow-up of the conference Dark Heavens that we organized around one year ago, um, always in cooperation with Transparency International that uh, has been uh, uh, cooperating with us also for this year after two very great years of sharing and interaction. And so that conference back in the time uh, was working on the discourse of the Panama and the Paradise Papers. Um, and we decided to focus uh, on the aspect uh, of the Paradise Paper that we thought that uh, uh, was very important, that is related also to tax havens, uh, uh, to global finance uh, in the real estate markets and in the corruption related to it. Uh, so uh, from today on, we will dig uh, into matters like uh, tax havens in real estate business, but also the loopholes uh, that the global finance uh, is uh, finding and is making possible to disrupt this market, to acquire even more properties. And so these kind of loopholes that they use um, are uh, actually affecting not only our everyday life, but also uh, the wealth of the um, global situation in we are in and producing a real inequality, as we will see during uh, the conferences. Um, and uh, uh, we also notice uh, that uh, uh, over this kind of control, basically, the city of Berlin loses around 100 million euro of real estate transfer tax uh, every year. So this is really a, is a big sum. Uh, there are big consequences, uh, not only on our private lives, but also uh, in the way we are... Uh, um, addressing corruption and addressing the hidden data and investigation. And we are really trying to uh, unveil this kind of uh, uh, hidden uh, information during today, tomorrow, and also the day after. Um, so we will have with us great speakers that Lieke is going to introduce and also the program of the next days. Um, so I will pass now uh, the word to Lieke that will go on uh, in describing what is going to happen. Thank you, Lieke. So yeah, hello and welcome everybody to our online conference. So I will just say a little bit about the program that we have for you this weekend. So today we will start uh, diving into how exactly the global finance is influencing the current housing crisis. So we will start with the keynote on anonymous and aggressive real estate investors in Berlin and Barcelona with Christoph Trautvetter, Manuel Cabarra de Sous, and moderated by ECA uh, from Transparency International. Um, then we continue uh, after that with a panel on money laundering in London and Dubai. And this will be with Sam Leon of Global Witness and Karina Shadrovsky of OCCRP. And finally, today we close off with a conversation on the documentary Push with the director Frederik Gerten and Leilani Farha, the main character in this film. Um, then tomorrow we continue looking at some of the counter strategies and some of the activism happening in this field. Uh, so tomorrow we start the day with a talk by the Deutsche Wohnen Co. and Eignen Initiative with Volkan Simon. 
And this is followed by a keynote uh, on how to secure housing as a human right with Leilani Farha, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing, and Justus von Daniels of Corrective. And then we are also very excited tomorrow to have the premiere of the short film by the Steel This Poster Collective. And after that, we close with a panel uh, focused on uh, activism and exactly these kind of counter strategies on how to resist speculation. And this panel is uh, joined by Jonathan Miller of Berlin versus Amazon, Marco Clausen of the Prince Zinnegarten, and also the Steel This Poster Collective. And finally, on Sunday, we close off with the online city tour visiting the invisible, also with Christoph Trautvetter. So um, just a few words on how you can actually participate in this online event. Uh, we have a chat, which you can see on the right of the screen from our website. And there you can ask questions and also interact with the others there. And if you want, it's also nice if you introduce yourself, because we're also uh, excited to hear that so many people are joining from all kinds of places around the world. Um, and yeah, we will collect the questions to ask them at, to the speakers during the Q&A. But please don't wait uh, till the Q&A starts. Just ask your questions in between so that we have time to collect them and, and summarize them. Um, then before we start, a final word of thanks to our funders and partners. Uh, as Tatiana mentioned, we're very happy to cooperate with Transparency International for this event. And we also want to thank our funders. Uh, first of all, the Senat Department for Culture and Europe in Berlin. Uh, also the Riva and David Logan Foundation, the Bundescentrale for Politische Bildung, and the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation. And uh, we were happy to be supported also by a grant from the Foundation Open Society Institute in cooperation with the OSIFA Institute of the Open Society Foundations. And uh, this conference also forms part of the Reimagine Europe project, which is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union. And uh, we also want to thank our knowledge partners, the Netzwerk Steuergerechtigkeit and the Hermes Center for Transparency and Digital Human Rights. And the online city tour was produced uh, in cooperation with the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. So also uh, thanks to them for uh, supporting us with the tour. And our activation community program is supported by the Guerrilla Foundation. And finally, also a final thanks to our media partners, uh, Tats, the Tages Zeitung, uh, to Förderfield and to Ex Berliner Magazine. So then handing back to you, Tatjana. Yes, thank you very much, Lieke. So we enter now into our keynotes, uh, anonymous and aggressive investors uh, who owns Berlin and Barcelona with Christoph Trautwetter and Manuel Gabarre de Sous. But first I would like to introduce Eka Rostomasvili uh, that works at Transparency International because she will be the moderator of this panel. Uh, Eka, as I say, works uh, as Transparency International as advocacy and campaign coordinator in Berlin. Uh, and uh, she uh, works around the cases of cross-border corruption. Prior to uh, joining uh, Transparency International, ECA was a communication associate at the Global Public Policy Institute. Uh, she also previously worked with Transparency International Georgia, um, and uh, inside this organization, she was working uh, on uh, um, civil engagements uh, and mon monitoring uh, the uh, effect of the engagement uh, of the uh, civic society for uh, four years. Um, so uh, just to explain a bit how it will work now to un make the people understand how the streaming is organized. Uh, now I will pass uh, the word to Ika that will introduce the panel and will introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, and uh, then we will have uh, uh, some uh, statements of our speakers uh, from uh, uh, Christoph Trautwetter and Manuel Gabarre de Sous and there will be a conversation among them. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, uh, you are really welcome, as Lika said, to join the chat and interact with us. We have uh, Steph Lenk that is moderating the chat and uh, uh, will also ask you to share resources. If you have comments, uh, if you also are working on projects, uh, please be free to share uh, your knowledge. And then uh, uh, I will come back at the end uh, by uh, posing your questions uh, to the speakers. Uh, 
and that there will be a collective discussion related to that. So I pass uh, then the word to Eka. Thank you very much, Eka, for being with us and also the great support that we had from Transparency International. And also I have to say to Christoph Trautwetter for this event. Also, I want to personally thank Christoph because he has been a, a very important uh, participant uh, and collaborator for shaping this conference. Uh, and a lot of his knowledge also went through what we did. So I really want to thank both of you because you did such a great work uh, and you do a great work at your organization. So we are really looking forward to hear more from your research. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction, Tatiana. It's been a real pleasure for Transparency International to collaborate with the Disruption Network Lab as part of the Art of Exposing Injustice conference series since last year, as you, as you mentioned. It's been, it's, we're already in the second year of our partnership. And we believe that this conference is a very timely contribution to the debate around common good, fairness and justice, which has been reinvigorated by the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. For the members of the audience who do not know us, uh, Transparency International is a global anti-corruption movement with presence in over 100 countries. We conduct research and lead on evidence-based advocacy with a vision that someday our societies, in our societies there will be no space for abuses of power. You can lear learn all about our work done at the national and global levels uh, from our website, uh, which is transparency.org. As anti-corruption civil society, our interest in um, today's topic of the conference, the, today's uh, the topic of our conference, uh, current conference, is very obvious. Uh, as demonstrated by scandal after scandal, real estate is one of the favorite choices of kleptocrats for parking and investing stolen money, often driving up prices and fueling property speculation. Scarcity in affordable housing in major cities is perhaps one of the most vivid examples of how corruption hurts not only those who the money is stolen from, but also people in other places. But of course, there are many other uh, factors and policy failures that reduce the availability of adequate and affordable housing. In the first keynote discussion of the conference, we will focus on the structural flaws in the global financial architect architecture that have enabled the reshaping of our cities in recent years, and unfortunately not for the better. Berlin and Barcelona are two cities that have seen massive spikes in real estate prices in the last few years, and, but also have become symbols of resistance against greedy corporate power. Through the examples of these two cities, we will hear about how, on the one hand, the opaque multi-layered ownership structures have allowed the offshoring of wealth, and on the other hand, aggressive strategies of the professional investors who have become the world's largest landlords have been able to commit predatory practices around the world. Our first speaker, Christoph Trautwetter, is a public policy expert who has been extensively collaborating with tax justice groups such as Global Alliance for Ta uh, Tax Justice in Germany and the Tax Justice Network, and most recently leading the Wem gehört die Stadt, which is translated as Who Owns the City, an initiative with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. He'll probably cringe at this and maybe even disagree, but I really have heard him being described by more than one person as a one-man crusader against faceless landlords in Berlin. The most recent study uh, co-authored by Christoph traces the ownership of more than 400 companies owning real estate in Berlin through public and commercial registers. And today, for the first time, we'll hear in, the gr in great detail about the results of this effort. Christoph, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I was having a bit of internet um, problems here. I hope that's fixed now. I'm connecting through the wireless, uh, through the phone now. Um, all right. Uh, can you hear me and can you see the slides? Um, perfect. Okay. So, um, evicted by greed is the topic of our um, conference this, uh, this weekend, and I'm very happy to hold the opening speech. Um, starting with some very general thoughts uh, on the word greed. Um, as you've seen from the pictures and the invitation, it's a lot about money and even some, some signs that you would connect um, with conspiracy theory, um, but that's not about it. Greed is a very human characteristic and all humans are somewhat greedy, sometimes greedy, um, but this conference is not gonna be about uh, human greed, but it's gonna be about the structures that facilitate greed in the real estate markets. And as um, 
Eka already pointed out very nicely, uh, I'm working on the Berlin real estate market, so I'm going to kick off this conference with a few examples uh, from Berlin uh, and the structures um, of housing and um, greed and financialization that I'm analyzing here. Um, but before starting, I want to show you the first slide, um, some numbers uh, of other cities and especially Barcelona that we're going to talk about after. And you're going to see that Berlin is very special uh, worldwide. So in Berlin, 85% of the people live for rent. Right? If you look at Barcelona, that's only 38%. And even in the financial capitals of the world, New York and London, many more people actually own their own house. In Berlin, this number is very, very low. Um, and Berlin is special for a second reason. And this you will see in the next slide. Um, Berlin has seen, after the financial crisis, an explosion of housing prices. So 10 years ago, Berlin was poor and sexy, and everyone from around the world wanted to come here because you could have a metropolitan life for very, very low prices. You could buy a house for as low as 2,000 square meters, which was one of the lowest prices in Germany at that time. But it has exploded to somewhere close to 6,000 euros. Uh, which means it has surpassed Barcelona, at least in the house prices. It hasn't reached Barcelona yet in, yet in terms of rent and also not in terms of uh, the share of salaries you pay. But the quality of life, the cost of life in Berlin has changed dramatically over the last years. And now we're going to have a look at the structures behind uh, this development. And on the next slide, you see again the most simple structure that most of you, wherever you come from around the world, would see that this is the normal situation. The person who lives in the house owns it, and there's no human interaction, and it looks like there's no space of greed, but that's actually not the case. Very often, uh, this poor person there that owns his house uh, has to take a loan, uh, and then he is a victim of greed by banks, and that's, uh, I guess, part of the story that we'll see in Barcelona, but that's not the Berlin story because that's 15% and in Kreuzberg where I live, it's even only 5% that actually own the apartment that they live in. The next group um, that you will see in the next slide um, are direct investors. So that's, if we discuss real estate here in Berlin, any measure that would regulate uh, or hurt um, owners, uh, the owner lobby always says, oh, but most of Berlin is owned by the nice old lady who is saving for her pension, usually lives upstairs and uh, doesn't hurt her tenants. And uh, we don't have perfect numbers. And I'm assembling these numbers, so all that you see here are estimates. But my estimate is that this nice old lady from upstairs is only 17.5%. So where the person who is the owner has direct content to the tenant without any corporate structure in between. And it's not always the nice, nice old lady. Uh, we just had a look at one example uh, of a conservative politician that owns uh, something like 40 houses here in Berlin. And uh, there's, it's a peculiarity of Berlin uh, law, but he is allowed to kick out his tenants if he claims to need the house himself. And he has done so seven times, kicked out his tenants on behalf of his family, but none of his family ever moved in. Okay, so that's the direct investors. Now it's going to get more interesting and more closely to the anonymous and financialized uh, part. So indirect investors, again, the, the ownership lobby would say that's the private people. Um, so they own 20%, but they don't do so directly like we've seen before, but they have a corporate structure that shields them from their investment usually with some wealth manager or someone in between managing the real estate for them. And again, that's problematic structurally. Uh, you can have very nice person, very nice manager and a very well managed house. But what we see more and more often is that you have a person that is completely detached from the investment, doesn't know what's happening on her behalf or his behalf. Uh, and we've had a very interesting case that we're going to visit on the tour on Sunday. Um, a woman or a family working as a philanthropist doing good, but with money that the manager makes from house investment or real estate investments here in Berlin, 
and uh, behaving very badly on the Berlin market. So doing good with money earned in a bad way. And that's facilitated by this indirect structure with someone in between. And these structures are going to get more complicated if you look at the next slide. Um, another 10%, and again, that's very special for Berlin, another 10% of the apartments here are owned by listed companies. So that are the, the big um, companies listed at the stock exchange. The biggest of them is Fanovia. Uh, the biggest in Berlin is Deutsche Wohnen, owning 115,000 apartments. Uh, and that usually doesn't exist. Usually listed companies and professional investors invest in commercial real estate and shopping, hotels, not in houses. In Berlin, they own a very big chunk of the apartments uh, and a big chunk of the apartments they own were previously state owned, then sold to the same investment funds that we'll see in the Bar Barcelona case, Cerberus, Blackstone and, and the like, uh, and then sold uh, to these companies. And if you just have a quick look at the structure, you will see, uh, just go back one second uh, with the last look at the structure, you will see in the structure, the normal people that own stocks of Deutsche Wohnen, but they're in the minority, the majority uh, of, the, of the stocks of those companies are owned by the professional investors that we now look at in the next slide. Um, and those are the investment funds, the private equity companies, um, Blackstone, Cerberus, uh, we'll talk more about that during the conference. And there you don't see any normal people because those investment funds are only made uh, for billionaires, for big professional investments, and sometimes also for private pensions and uh, some, some people behind that. All right, uh, the next slide, and we're getting close to the end of our ownership and uh, more towards the solution side. Um, so one possible solution that is discussed everywhere is uh, housing should be owned publicly. And in Berlin, that's 17.5%. Uh, and the city is very aggressively trying to buy apartments. So anyone who wants to sell apartments has to first ask the city whether they want to buy. And the city is also trying to build. Um, but that is, they're realizing that this takes time and it's very difficult. And they're planning to build 40,000 apartments within the next uh, five years, four years. Uh, where in the past, some years ago, when the moods were different, they sold easily 100,000 uh, at a much lower price. So trying to regain what they had in the past, but often paying a very high price for doing so. And the last ownership group, um, and I particularly like the structural graph, if you look at it, um, so that's another very vocal group here in Berlin. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, you will see, uh, so that those are cooperatives. Um, so they are very, very old in Germany very often. So between the first and the second world war, a lot of uh, housing was built uh, and bought by those cooperatives, often with state funding. They have usually very low rents and own about 10% and always think they're part of the solution and the nice guys, which is true because they don't speculate. They are very, very long-term and have low rents, but they have one problem that it's usually um, a cooperative. So they work for their members and sometimes, or even quite often, the members are all pretty similar and uh, not representing the whole interest of the city. So just to finish, to sum up, uh, in the next slide, you will just see uh, um, uh, the overview. Um, I will not go too into details. We're still working on that uh, with our project, Who Owns the City, still collecting the data that doesn't exist, that isn't easily accessible. Um, but if you look at this graph, you will see that more or less half of Berlin is in danger of, uh, of uh, facing greedy investors. And that's why this topic is so strong and so important here in the city. Uh, and that's why um, it's been a very, uh, very, very um, hard, but very interesting work to do. And I think um, we'll have a, have a very hard and interesting uh, weekend to discuss those structures, to discuss those, those investors uh, and to find out and discuss uh, how, so first to find out how the structures, the structure is set up, facilitates greed, and then also uh, develop ideas how to solve it and how to address uh, these investors. And um, I wish us and everyone good luck with that.
Thank you, Christoph, for sharing uh, these results of your study. I'm sure some of uh, the members of the audience will find it surprising uh, that uh, the management companies uh, who are receiving the rent uh, are, it, it's difficult or sometimes impossible to trace uh, ownership structures uh, who really benefits from the rent or mortgages, but more active uh, activists who have been uh, in this scene, probably uh, this didn't come to them as a surprise. Um, I wanted to ask you how your tax-related research brought, to you, brought you to um, investigating real estate, real estate ownership in Berlin. Uh, how, how did that come about, if you can explain to our audience? Thanks, uh, Eka, for that question. Um, so I came to, I'm pretty new to real estate, actually. I started three years ago um, with one investor here in Kreuzberg. Um, it was an investment fund from Jersey uh, and some local journalists approached me and asked me how those structures that they were using, so they had uh, companies in Cyprus and in Luxembourg uh, and then in Jersey and then the UK, uh, asked me how to understand this setup and uh, to understand what was happening uh, and uh, I quickly saw that this is exactly what we're working on in the tax justice movement, right, so we're looking at corporate structures and tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions uh, using those complex uh, structures to avoid taxes, uh, to launder dirty money, uh, to bring corporate uh, dirty corrupt money into, into our um, markets. And I saw that uh, housing is basically where those two stories meet, right? Where you can see this global financial market at your doorstep and you see how those structures actually come to you and uh, housing is also uh, the most important place for dirty money for tax avoidance for tax evasion because everywhere you go to housing and especially city property makes up more than half of the wealth right so a lot of money a lot of wealth is housing and a lot of and as every every wealth and every every pile of money always attracts greedy investors and attracts uh, people trying to loan the money trying to avoid taxes evade taxes uh, so you will find them in the housing as well as in many other places uh, but in in the housing it's a very very good place to show them and that's how from my work with uh, tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions and tax avoidance and money laundering uh, i entered the real estate market and the real estate research as one field where the consequences become most visible and tangible also for people. Mm -hmm. And just to, again, uh, talk about tax really quickly, uh, is there any estimate or is it possible to even estimate how much tax is Berlin or Germany, for example, losing annually due to the loopholes in the global financial architecture? So that's uh, that's the next step after I after I identified the um, after I identified the ownership structures. I will have a look at the tax uh, that is avoided, but uh, I think that's uh, mission impossible. Just like the ownership structure, um, we heard the number of hundred million that is lost to the transfer through the transfer tax. That's the most easy and most obvious um, tax avoidance mechanism that we hear reported over and over. And not even for this we have any reliable numbers. Because the problem with tax avoidance is it's or tax evasion and money laundering and all of it, it is this part that no one knows that happens illegally or hidden or at least uh, not visible to the tax agencies. Otherwise, they would stop it. Uh, so no one really has those numbers. But uh, I'm what I can tell at least if you don't look only at uh, real estate transfer tax, but also look at the uh, people that don't pay tax on the value gains, so the price increases that uh, very, very often stay completely untaxed. If you look at um, the profits from the rent income that are often, shift often shifted through Luxembourg to the Cayman Islands and to other places, we leave the area of millions and we very, very quickly get to billions. And if you look at the German level with the housing boom we had, we were losing definitely more than 10 billion uh, every year. 
You have already partially answered my next question. I wanted to ask you about your next, uh, your future plans and next steps. Uh, maybe first you can talk about the specific uh, kind of follow up, follow up action, uh, if anything is planned uh, about these findings that you presented today. Uh, for example, are you thinking of um, referring uh, the companies that are very clearly uh, you have found are violating the uh, transparency laws to any authority uh, agencies, to any law enforcement agencies or, or, or other authorities, and um, kind so, of related to that. So, first of all, please go ahead. Exactly, it was already quite a big question, so I would just uh, <laughs> I would just answer it. Um, so, first of all, the the research is not done, so we. What, what we're doing here in Berlin is actually, because there is no official data and the real estate register is not public, we do our, we collect our data case by case. All right, so every day I get, or every week I get new cases, I research the ownership structure, I add, add them to my data collection and get a better picture of who owns Berlin. Um, so I'm currently trying to assemble and do a really full structural analysis, but that's an ongoing work and we're gonna expand that to the whole of Germany. Um, but the second part that you were referring to, uh, that's the first step of our research that is done that we have published very recently. Uh, we've published at least um, 80 cases from our 400 cases that we have collected, uh, where uh, despite the transparency regulations that we have, um, the ownership was not uh, possible to trace. So people who are supposed to uh, give their name and say, I'm the owner of this apartment, they didn't, they didn't register as they were supposed to. Uh, and this list of 80 uh, companies with anonymous owners that own real estate here in Berlin, we forwarded them uh, to the agency that's responsible for enforcing transparency on them. Uh, and we will have a look at uh, what comes out of that. Um, and the fines and hopefully uh, additional transparency to include that in our study on actually who owns Berlin and include that in our understanding that we then also want to make uh, accessible for tenants in Berlin um, to help them with their individual cases. Uh, thank you. That's uh, that's wonderful. That's really exciting. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, since we still have a couple of minutes before we uh, open uh, to our next speaker, I also wanted to ask you if um, the evidence that you have already collected, while incomplete but still uh, quite solid evidence, um, can that be used for improving practice in terms of collecting ownership information on the companies? Is there any policy reform that could be triggered by, by your study, for example? That could be uh, also something for uh, organizations like Transparency International, uh, that could also be our role. All right, so I mean, there's two elements. So the, the study that we published now on transparency and ownership, that's something that Transparency International definitely will have to take forward. Um, and that's a problem that is global, right? So people who own companies should not stay anonymous anywhere in the world. And that's uh, what we see here. We have companies from Berlin, but we have companies from all over the world owning real estate and that's we need a global solution that around the world it's not possible to stay anonymous if you want to own a company right and that's the work of ti uh, that's where you will have to work and the second part is then once you know the ownership um, you have to draw the right conclusions for um, housing regulation for regulating real estate markets and that's something um, that I'm actually very confident that will happen here in Berlin. We have a very, very left government that is looking and a very active uh, tenant movement. As you saw, like 85% of the people are tenants. So the majority of this city wants better uh, regulation. But what at the moment, what they're missing is the information and the data. So with the additional transparency, I think it will be very quick and easy to actually change politics here because the majority will see that something is wrong. Uh, and will change and we already have a government that is very left and prepared to change things uh, if only they would knew, know properly what they're doing. Thank you very much. 
I think we are now going to go to Spain, uh, where our next speaker, Manuel Cabaret is Asus, uh, who's a lawyer and a researcher with the Observatory uh, Against Economical Crime in Madrid, uh, and is a former civil servant turned activist, will tell us about how um, the uh, 2008 economic recession, uh, at the heart of which were the housing market, at the heart of which was the housing markets and the uh, uh, neoliberal solutions applied back then, are um, painfully felt uh, in Barcelona. Um, so, uh, Manuel extensively researches uh, the causes and effects of the housing crisis in uh, Spain, both in Madrid and Barcelona, and is helping um, activists uh, and supplying activists with uh, evidence and research to make sure that the, um, the activism is powered by uh, quality evidence. Uh, so, I think we're ready for you, Manuel. Take it away. Okay. I think it's uh, very important that uh, opportunistic investment funds have landed into Barcelona. And firstly, what is an opportunistic investment fund? The opportunistic investment fund try to, to find opportunities of uh, benefits for 10%, 10%, 15 15% every year. So they look for risky investments and with a, a strong possibility, a strong potential of enormous benefits. So. Uh, they decided to land in Spain and especially in Barcelona for several reasons that I will try to explain briefly in this presentation. Um, the main reasons are espe especially the, the regulation. And during these years, from 2015 to 2019, in just four years, the rent prices have increased, have raised by means of the 50%. So uh, flat which could cost 1,000 euro in 2015, may well cost 1,500 uh, 1, euros four years after. So uh, the potential of benefits is enormous. Um, before, before the subprime crisis of 2008, the Spanish financiers and Catalan financiers trust, trust in a model based on mortgages and property. But after the subprime crisis, the commercial banks went into bankruptcy or big problems at least, and they uh, should abandon this model. So they enter the Wall Street investment funds which, which trust in rent instead of property. Why? Because of the job insecurity which are in Spain after the crisis. And the opportunity, the, the investment funds saw this opportunity because of the regulation. There is no regulation of rents and housing in Spain. And, and there are different layers of the regulation, the international layer, the European Union layer, and the national layer. I will start with the international layer. The commercial banks are regulated in the, through the Basel agreements. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervision establish the rules that all the banks in Europe and the, most of the countries must fulfill. And this after the crisis, the supreme crisis, they force the commercial bank banks to increase their solvency and their capital. So the, peri the banks of the peripheric countries such as Spain or Ireland couldn't fulfill these requirements. Why? Because they have inherited an enormous amount of non-performing loans from evictions and developers, non-performing loans of developers also. So they have a, a staggering amount of real estate assets and a bad situation, bad economic situation. So because of this regulation, they must to sell these assets in the place of seven years from 2012 and before 2019. The Basel Agreement reassured the structure of the economy through two different channels. This point is very important. Since the 80s, it has been established, I'm going to use a metaphor of the channels of water, of two channels. The economy flows through two different channels. Um, we are in the first channel, the, where is uh, regulation, there are taxes, there is identification of everyone, is within the nations. But there is another channel which is that in this channel there are no regulation, there are no taxation, there are no, it is anonymous, completely anonymous. And the investment funds use this second channel 
to operate. So the consequences are the increasement of inequality because uh, there is no more uh, redistribution of the wealth in a, within a country. So we have a paradoxical reality, a paradox. There is a lot of money in the tax havens and after the real economy it doesn't provide strong benefits, the strong benefits that the opportunistic funds are looking for, the 10-15% benefits. So what do they do, the managers of this, this uh, wealth of the tax havens? They try to invest in basic needs. Why? Because basic needs couldn't be avoided. So people have to pay for it. One very obvious is housing. So that's the reason they invest in electricity, health, or especially housing. Okay, so we have also the European Union level, the layer of the European Union. The bailout of Spain was signed between uh, the country of Spain to rescue the financial system of Spain and the European Union provided a bailout of 100 billion of euros, but under several conditions. Most of, most of them uh, were related to real estate, to real estate property. For instance, they forced the Spanish state to create a bad bank. What is a bad bank? A bad bank, firstly, is quite confusing <laughs> because it's not bad per se and it's not a bank at all. It's just a real estate asset manager. And this bad bank received a loan of 50 billion of the European Union directly from the European Union to buy the real estate assets of the Spanish banks which went into failure, into bankruptcy. So, they collect 106 billion of non-performing loans and real estate assets and they sold the real the bad bank sold these assets to the mostly to Wall Street investment funds without any transparency. But the Spanish state is still responsible for this debt because it endorsed the loan to the bad, of the bad bank. So the Spanish state debt in fact 40 billion of euros and the bad bank has sold the most of his assets, so it's a big problem for Spain. And after, the European Union forced also to exempt taxes to ownership, to real estate ownership. And for instance, the Spanish state, uh, real estate uh, companies' rates don't pay company tax, and they do not pay also the uh, transfer tax, which is in Spain 10%. But if you are an investment fund, you don't pay nothing for that because it's quite unfair. In, in fact, it's um, designed to uh, red out the, uh, roll out roll out the red carpet to the investment funds of from Wall Street to acquire the the housing of Spain. So uh, it, it's very important also that in 2012 the rent content was reduced to just three years. Why? Because in this way, they could create a bubble. If you have a tenant which pay 1,000 euros in Barcelona in 2015, after three years, you can oblige him to pay 1,500 1, euros and he can agree with it or leave the house. There is no other option. So this is the creation of this, this bubble, which is uh, Spain suffering. And also, it's very important that the uh, public housing in Barcelona for rent is just the 1% of the total of the of the of the amount of housing so it's very it's very few and it can't control the prices in no way in in my video presentation i explain with uh, quite uh, accuracy how um, this hypothesis was used by cerberus because in spain it, they landed a lot of investment funds opportunistic such as blackstone cerberus or lone star especially in the city of barcelona they bought the majority of the houses with uh, were owned by the banks and how did they manage to to how manage to to do it because they have a strong political contact within the country Cerberus left germany in 2011 to move to opportunities to big opportunities which were presented in the periphery countries such as ireland or spain mainly so they con with server is very close to a republican party so they use these connections to enter into the Spanish and Irish market. In Spain, they contracted the son of the former president, Jose Maria Aznar, which was very close to the Republicans. Do you remember maybe the invasion of Iraq? And they contracted his son and his best friend as the president and counselor in Cerberus here in Spain.
And also Cerberus used several strategies to, to acquire the money necessary to buy the houses because there are operations of two billion, there are billions of euros in this operation and they acquire the money through the banks, in fact, controlled by Cerberus. These, uh, banks, uh, there are several banks in Europe controlled by these companies, such as Baba Group, the Austrian bank, Deutsche Bank, or Commerzbank, which uh, were Stephen Feinberg is one of the major shareholders. So Deutsche Bank or Baba Group finance the operation of Cerberus in Spain to acquire the assets. And the consequences are extremely damaging to the people of Barcelona because rents have increased 30 times faster than wages. So there is a strong bu bubble with dramatic consequences for the city. Thank you very much, Manuel, for very illuminating, uh, for sharing your illuminating findings and insights. Uh, this is not often discussed uh, in the media or in the public when we talk about the housing crisis in Barcelona, uh, the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Uh, maybe we can continue talking about Cerberus, which you uh, you have already mentioned that there's a longer version of your presentation, uh, which will become available through Disruption Network Labs website, uh, where our audience can learn more about their operations. But perhaps in this Q and A, we can also talk a little bit about how why do you single them out, uh, and how are their operations uh, different from, let's say, Blackstone and what makes them such a, uh, a key offender in Barcelona. I have to say that um, it sur surprised me, Cerberus. When, when I was doing the research, I didn't know so much about Cerberus. I thought that every investment fund is quite similar, the opportunistic fund, funds, but in fact, not. Cerberus, at least, is very particular. For instance, it's a limited partnership and, uh, company uh, to not disclose information. It's a company obsessed with secretive, with, with secret, with secrecy. Uh, for instance, his founder, Stephen Feinberg, said once that he they try Cerberus to hide religiously. So they are in that way obsessed with secrecy. All the investment funds are quite secretive, are very secretive. They work in tax havens and so on, but the case of Cerberus is very special. Cerberus, maybe the reason is because uh, is that Cerberus have a, a strong link with the Republican Party, because several of the main chairs of the Republican Party during the presidents of Bush, for instance, are now the main executives of Cerberus. That's the case of Dan Quayle, which was the former vice president with George Bush, the father, or Jon Snow, the secretary of the Treasury, which is like the Ministry of Finance, uh, during George W. Bush. So they try to uh, occult all the information that they have. And after, they are involved in several scandals, both in, in Ireland and in Spain, especially in, the, in Ireland. Um, NAMA is the bad bank of Ireland, like Saref in Spain. And in the, they sold all the Northern Ireland properties in just one operation, the Project Eagle. And in the eve of the bid, both Dan Quayle met with um, the president of Northern Ireland, Peter Robinson, and also in the uh, in the eve of the bid, John Snow met with Michael Noonan, which was at that time the uh, Minister of Finance of Ireland. And after Cerberus bought by 1.7 billion the properties of, of NAMA in Northern Ireland, and it has earned hundreds and hundreds of, of millions of euros. But it appeared after a payment of seven million pounds in the Isle of Man, which are connected to this operation allegedly. And these are connected to Peter Robinson, to a former president of Northern Ireland. So now it's under the investigation of the National Crime Agency of the United Kingdom, and it's a big scandal. And also, we can say that Cerberus use strange, we are going to say strange, tactics like using. Uh, they buy banks in Europe, like Baba Group, or are the main shareholders between the main shareholders of Commerzbank and Deutsche Bank. Why? Because they are not very profitable investments. Because uh, the banks couldn't provide dividends because of Basel, but they have access to European Central Bank money. So that is the is an strategic investment. 
So Cerberus could use its own banks, its own control banks, such as Babak, to make the operations, the operation divariant that I explained in the presentation, or other operations with a strong impact on the city of Barcelona, like the Sabadell, another important Spanish bank, sold all its real estate assets because of the obligation of Basel one year ago, and the fi uh, it was financed by Deutsche Bank also because of this kind weird relationship of Cerberus. Mm -hmm. and, and we can say also <laughs> that Cerberus don't trust anymore in the productive economy because they invested in 2007 in Chrysler, in the fabricant of cars, and it would have gone into bankruptcy Cerberus because it invested seven billion of dollars and one year after it cost one billion of dollars, but the Obama uh, government rescued Cerberus. So they have really, really a strong connections. I have to say also that Stephen Feinberg is a, is a big donor of Donald Trump. He gave him $1.5 million to the Donald Trump campaign. And he is the president of the board of intelligence assessment of Donald Trump. And also, which is completely strange for me at least, is that Donald Trump, is supposedly, as the New York Times says one month ago, Donald Trump is uh, thinking to uh, appoint Stephen Feinberg, the president of Cerberus, to the Intelligent Agency of the United States for a prominent charge, as an, uh, a senior charge within there. So the connection with the power is too tight in the case of Cerberus. Outrageous. We will talk about the possible solutions uh, to the problems like, like a revolving door, as you described, and lack of regulation a bit later. But I also wanted to ask you if there has been uh, any encouraging response to your research findings, you, which I understand you publish regularly through, um, you published a book, for example, last year, which is called Invisible Hand, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Towards the bottom, Invisible Hand. And you regularly publish in Spanish media uh, about these problems, um, what has been the response to your findings, um, including from policymakers, if any? Yes, yes. I, I think um, the, the Spanish uh, mass media are controlled by the banks because they cannot pay off the debt, they, they con the loans they contract before the crisis. So, in fact, they are con they are owned by the main banks. So. There are no a critic point of view usually in the mass media, but they are arise. Uh, they have arisen a, a lot of new medias, and I publish in that media. I publish an article about the bad bank. I think one of the first critic from a critic point of view investigations about this. And um, the bad bank uh, answered publicly to me through Twitter in a very rude way, I have to say, and without reasons, without consistent reasons. And I answered them back and with, well, politely and with reasons. And I think it uh, strengthened a lot the, the, the article because it was made very, very popular uh, in, the, in the internet. More than 100,000 100, people read it. So, yes, it has, has an impact. And also in the city of Barcelona, there are politics that uh, are trying to change the things for, uh, in the last years. And, and I have seen interest uh, of them. And also in the national government, it has changed the path of Spain of the regulation um, from a couple of years ago. At least it's like the final end, they complete the regulation, they have increased the, the term of the rent contract to five years or seven years in case of investment funds. And also they are trying to build a project of social housing in the country. So it's a very good thing for Spain because it wasn't nothing. The model was based on, on ownership and mortgage because of the influence of the banks in the Spanish politics. But now it seems that there are changes. And I asked Christoph earlier, and it would be great to hear from you as well, if you have any exciting research or plans, uh, any kind of plans that's come, that uh, we can expect from you um, regarding uh, yeah, any follow-up investigations or activism that is planned around uh, uh, Barcelona housing uh, market. Did you hear my question? I'm sorry. Manuel? Yes. 
<laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> if you could share with us any research plans, it would be very exciting and interesting to hear if you plan to continue investigating the same issues or if there's if there are going to be new investment funds or bad banks that are going to be the focus of your research, we'd like to know. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I am collaborating with some projects, yeah, with uh, several projects, a sociological project about the uh, strategies of the investment funds, the aggressive strategies of the investment funds uh, to the tenants in the city of Madrid. We are developing a project, a sociological project with legal issues, I mean, of the legal issues. And after, uh, I'm also collaborating in a new book, I hope it will come up one in one year uh, about this situation, the investment funds, the bad bank, and all this situation, because there is a complete lack of information in Spain. Okay, really, really, the, the, I think it's very important. It's very out of the blue because nobody is writing from a critic point of view about this with a strong consequences. So yes, yes, I have several projects. Thank you very much. Very exciting and interesting. We'll Thank look you. forward to hearing about your new studies and your new book. Uh, I think hmm. we should go back to Chris, our first keynote speaker, uh, so, who hopefully is still there. And um, well, the first question that I have for you, Chris, uh, and maybe we can discuss also um, uh, together with Manuel, is um, to what extent you spoke when you uh, at the beginning of your presentation you opened with uh, how the housing prices have uh, spiked since the 2008 financial crisis uh, can you talk about the connection and uh, the extent to which this crisis was uh, the berlin housing crisis was also a legacy of um, um, the post 2008 developments uh, like barcelona All right, so I think that's a, that's a very difficult question. So maybe just uh, do one word on, on Cerberus. Cerberus was in Berlin before the financial crisis. So when housing in Berlin was very, very cheap and the state was desperate to sell assets, the state was deeply indebted. And we had this era, era of, um, uh, of liberalization of sell, small state, uh, selling out public assets that's when Cerberus came to Germany and bought um, the public housing and then they sold it and then they moved on to Spain after the financial crisis um, and what happened in Berlin uh, all as you could see in the graph of the price development happened after the financial crisis but it started it, and so if you look at the story of Berlin the financial crisis uh, didn't wasn't resolved at least so you don't see it you had a lot of investors coming to Germany in 2005 and 2006 because housing was so cheap and they didn't know where to go with all the, that they had, the capital that they had accumulated. Then the financial crisis happened and their plans to out. Some of them actually had to re sell their houses again. Some of them went bankrupt because the pr housing boom they were ex expecting didn't happen as fast as they thought. Um, but then it happened because um, actually, nothing changed after the financial crisis. Uh, the amount of money that is floating around the world and looking for investments actually kept increasing and increasing and increasing, and the central pushed out more money, um, and the interest rates fell further and further. So the problem we had before the financial crisis, too much money slushing around, uh, was just made worse after the financial crisis, and that's when it arrived in Berlin Housing. Um, and that's where we still are now in the Corona crisis. The same thing is happening. The Berlin housing prices are not collapsing. The housing prices are increasing and increasing because now the state and the central banks again put out more money. The interest rates are low. Uh, investors are desperate to find investment and buy anything that they can buy. And uh, that uh, very often then is residential houses here in Berlin. So we're definitely still suffering from the problem of before the financial crisis. Uh, of accumulated capital, desperate for investment, that was what led to the financial crisis in 2008, wasn't resolved, got even worse, and uh, that's at the point where we are now, both in Berlin and in Barcelona, I think. Uh, Manuel, next question is for you. Um, so we are living the second crisis, uh, which is the coronavirus crisis, and uh, 
Uh, many have compared with the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Um, can you share with us any projections or any thoughts that you have, any impact uh, that the COVID-19 crisis might have on the housing market in Spain, Barcelona or Madrid? And you also mentioned housing bubble. Uh, could you also maybe elaborate on that a little bit and um, tell us what you think might happen uh, to the bubble uh, post-COVID-19 -cri post crisis? I think there are strong possibilities of the bubble burst because in Spain it will, it will, there will be difficult conditions because of the job insecurity, a lot of temporal job, a lot of unemployment. So in that way, we are coming back to the 2007 situation, unfortunately. And uh, I think also that here it's important to think about that Cerberus use its own banks to finance its operations. So when Cerberus take a loan, they pledge the, the houses, the units, and in case they couldn't pay off the loan, they deliver the houses, but it is not going to happen because they share interest. So I think um, the result will be that these banks, such as Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank, BBVA, or Baba Group, will ask for money to the European Central Bank to the 0% or even negative interest, and they will lend that money to Cerberus to maintain in some way the operation because it's in their own interest, because it's the same, the same interest, the same owner. So I think it's an important clue of, of, of this situation, yes. And the... But uh, we are going to face, uh, uh, there are a lot of, of things in, in this situation. Also, the, tourist, the tourism has a, a strong impact on the, on the Spanish cities. Because if you see, you mm, compare the, the rates of the rents in the Spanish cities, they are, they are not the richest cities of the country. They are the most touristic ones. For instance, the, most, uh, the biggest race is in Palma de Mallorca, which is in the, in the islands of Baleares. And also in the Canary Islands, where there is a lot of unemployment, but the rents have increased by 50%, even as in Barcelona or Madrid. So the tourism has a strong impact, and there is not going to be tourism like an Airbnb uh, during this summer. So we'll see a lot of mess, I think, here. And also the situation of the tenants will be very difficult because of unemployment, very precarious conditions, and they are the movements are trying to elaborate some strategies to cope with this situation. Thank you. Um, in many ways, the housing crisis in Berlin and Barcelona are perfect examples of the impact of the dominance of financial markets, institutes and elites on, over economic policy. Uh, my next question is for Chris, um, uh, Christopher, Christoph, uh, what are some ideological shifts that are needed to curb the oversized influence of financial markets over socioeconomic outcomes of people around the world, if you can speak to that? I think ideological shifts is a good way to call what needs to happen. So in the work that, uh, that we do here in the Berlin housing market, um, and we try to help people to research their owner, some tenants ask us, like, how does this help uh, me with my apartment? And I often have to tell them, well, maybe I cannot really help your individual case, uh, but your case cannot be solved without changing the system and without an ideolog uh, ideological shift. And I think that's uh, what we need. Uh, so we need to shift from the neoliberal approach to say, um, we have to please the market. Politics and regulation has to try everything, do everything to attract the shy capital that otherwise is going to rush away to any other opportunity somewhere in the world, to a situation where there's no shortage of capital at all. We have negative interest rates, so people actually give you money to invest. Um, and we have a lot of capital looking for investment and a shortage of good investment. So politicians and politics and societies have to regain the courage to regulate and to tell, OK, capital, you are not the, the problem. Investments and people are the problem and we're going to regulate and you're going to invest anyway, but under our conditions, under our society and political conditions and not yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Manuel, if we speak in more practical terms, what are some political processes that need to uh, change uh, to help achieve that, especially on the ground? 
and how can more transparency help that? You both uh, spoke about secrecy and transparency as a kind of a solution to uncovering and exposing the predatory practices of uh, our corporate landlords. If you can speak to um, how we can have uh, better outcomes and better processes on the ground through increased transparency. I think it's very, very important to to disclose information because in that way it's so unfair what is going what is going on. That if we disclose, we manage to disclose this information. I think it will have an impact on the on the public opinion. So that's the reason that the investment funds or the bad bank of Spain is so worried by a small article in a minority web, because. I think before the political changes that are completely needed in the within the scope of the European Union and the national scope also, there is a change of the political opinion. I think we are in that way, in some way. I think we are better than, at least in Spain, than 15 years before, where it was an individualistic approach to, to housing and to more things. Now, with the spread of uh, rents, of tenants, I think it, things are, are changing. And I think it's very important to to provide the social movements with with good information, with good uh, background to face the investment funds, the mass media in some ways, and to to face the, the situation. I think it's, it's really important to 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 win this ideological battle, if you want to 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 see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, perhaps we can talk about also a bit about uh, what Berlin and Barcelona can learn from each other. Um, uh, we both have uh, kind of used the same keywords and we can connect. Uh, we can see that some of the problems repeat themselves in both cities and perhaps globally in most major cities. Uh, but maybe you can have a discussion about what is it? Uh, you also mentioned like there are some key differences as well. Um, maybe you can discuss, uh, we can start with you, Christoph, uh, if you can tell us what you think, uh, perhaps uh, Berlin research, B B Berlin can learn from Barcelona activists or experience of Barcelona um, to advance progressive reforms. So I, I think the two cities are very interesting because they face the same problems, but at a different stage. So financialization, I would think, is more advanced in Germany, um, but rents are higher in Barcelona, right? So the prices are growing faster here in Berlin, but the rents are still lower. So I think Barcelona um, can learn some things from the um, rent regulation uh, and regulating rental markets that uh, is very strong here in Germany and in Berlin. Not strong enough, we're still uh, struggling with it. And I think um, the other way around, um, uh, Berlin can learn uh, how to deal with uh, with very high rents and uh, how to deal with all the problems that uh, are, fa are ahead of Berlin still, uh, when people can't afford to live in the city anymore. Um, and I think then uh, we have uh, good diff different the same problems at very different times and good opportunities to learn. Hmm. I agree with you. Um, for instance, here, 15 years ago, it was a very individualistic approach to housing. There wasn't public housing, and everyone wanted to to contract a mortgage. So uh, after the crisis, things changed. It was a verse in the Spanish mentality. And I think um, in this generation, in the generation of people who is 20 30, or 30 years or 40, especially, there are no so opportunities to, to contact a mortgage. So things are changing. There are trade unions of tenants, very vibrant and with a lot of ideas, a lot of, I think there is a, a lot of lively situations, good reports. There are a lot of people researching. So things are, are changing. And I think Berlin is a very good reference for, for that. And all the, 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 all the Central European countries have a lot of public housing because after the Second World War, uh, it was developed the social democracy in a lot of countries with a strong uh, public uh, uh, projects such as Vienna or Amsterdam or France or United Kingdom. But here in Spain, it was a dictatorship. So there wasn't any social housing. 
in, in that way, it explains uh, the, the approach of, of Spanish people to, to mortgages. And maybe just to add one more thing, um, I think what Berlin can definitely and should learn from Barcelona, subsidizing people to own their own house, so that's what the liberals and the conservatives suggest, won't solve the problem. Right? You've seen that the rate of ownership is much, much higher in Barcelona, but you still have the same problems, even worse. So just giving people a bit of help to buy their own apartments won't save them from greed. Uh, we'll need a more um, communal solution. I think also that the negative consequences the, for the prosperity of the country uh, of Spain is a good example on how things shouldn't be done publicly for, for countries with regulation. The consequences of the regulation are, are here in just four years, 50% of, of race increment, all the money uh, is uh, away from the country without paying any tax. So it's a, a strong problem from, from the country for the prosperity of the country. So I think it's, it's very important to, to learn that in a negative way, as a negative example of what shouldn't be done. Uh, like the neoliberal approach to housing is a disaster for the society as a whole. Manu, recently uh, Spain passed a law or made a, a change, made an amendment to the law uh, that allowed, uh, that requires that rent contracts are extended from three to five years, uh, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Could you speak to that? Could you tell us if you think it's a win for uh, activists or if the problem will persist? Yeah, I think it's a win. I think it's a win um, because it, it's not. Uh, it's, it's important uh, the increase from three to five years or even seven years if the landlord is an investment fund. And above all, it changed the path of the deregulation of Spain. It changed the complete uh, jungle of, of housing market. And it, it's. I think it's the as, like a point of of entry in the in the question. And yes, I think it's a win of the movement. There are a lot of people who have fought uh, a lot with uh, diverse results, but they are they are managing to to make changes. And, and also, it, it has been developed a new project of social housing in Spain, which is a new, a complete new, between the state and the and the town halls. And I hope it will work well. So I think yes, it's a victory of the social movement. And there is a lot of pressure in the streets. And I think after, during the summer, after the co the COVID situation with the confinement and so on, I think it will be a lot of social struggle with the with the tenant because th there is with the confinement, people is meeting. There are a lot of uh, a lot of meetings, a lot of activism. So after the confinement, I think it will be a strong movement. There's also sorry, another um, proposal. Can I just so in Berlin, the, the rent contracts are eternal, right? Um, so it's not three or five years, it's uh, unlimited. So I guess mm. Barcelona has still a way to go. But even, even with these unlimited contracts, we still have problems with uh, renovation to get rid of tenants, with uh, claiming your daughter wants to move in to get rid of tenants. So many things to, to look out for, even if you're moving towards an unlimited rent contract. True. Uh, I think I have one more question for Manuel, um, because I've, I've read articles where you talk about property transfer, uh, transfer tax of 10% as a, one of the possible solutions to the housing crisis. And you mentioned also uh, in your presentation that one of the key problems is that these investment funds do not have to pay any tax upon entering the country. Um, can you tell us if you think this uh, proposal has any potential of, uh, for moving forward and um, how it would work? I think it has a potential and it could work. It has a potential because it is so unfair that if I am as a person, as Manuel Gavarre, if I buy a house, if I bought a house, I should have to pay between the 6 and the 10%, depending on the region, the land of of the country. And if you are an investment fund, you don't have to pay nothing. It's so unfair. I think I think it has a, politic, a political potential, a with a left-wing government. So 
and it would be very important because these investment funds they don't want to be landlords they they just want to earn money with commercing with money o sea, they, they lend money they borrow money and after they lend money and if there is some problem some issue as taxes it will dissuade them they they, they will be in some way expelled because they won't see such a opportunity they look for just the opportunity before entering into spain Blackstone, Cerberus, Lone Star, they were thinking how to go out from Spain. But to benefit the operation is that five years, the normal operation of a fund. And the, yes, they, they conceive the operation within five years and a strong benefit. So if there is a tax, I think it's a major problem for them. And it will it would work very well, in fact. And I, sorry if I just can uh, can share the Berlin perspective on that because it's exactly the same discussion we have here. We have a transfer tax that is six percent and not ten. Um, and actually, everyone in politics, even the conservatives and the liberals on the Fed at the federal level, agree that everyone should pay this tax. But the investment funds don't pay it, and the law that is trying to make investment funds pay and to close the loopholes that they use to avoid it is not getting anywhere because the tax agencies basically and the government and the uh, the administration says we don't actually have a way to know that investment funds are buying real estate because they don't buy the real estate directly they buy shares and companies somewhere in the cayman islands and so the government doesn't even realize that the apartment was sold because the apartment belongs to that cayman island company and just the ownership somewhere far away changed and the government doesn't even realize that they should levy the tax. And even the listed companies say, we don't know who owns us. The investment funds say, we don't know when our ownership changes, so we can't tell you that actually the owner of the house changed. And I think that's where actually we get back to the problem of transparency uh, and we don't manage to levy this transaction tax uh, because neither the government nor the investment funds themselves apparently are able to know Uh, when ownership changes because they don't know who owns them. Thank you, Christoph. Now I think I... Uh, yes, over yes. to you, Tatiana. <laughs> I am just uh, intervening here uh, because it's the moment of the question from the public. Uh, but first, I wanted to remember everybody listening to us, as also both uh, Manuel and Christoph were mentioning, that uh, we recorded in these uh, months uh, Uh, great video contributes from both of them uh, and uh, they are available on our website so if you also want to hear more from their research to you want to go more in depth uh, of what they are speaking about here uh, you can go on our website we created a specific page for this uh, that we are also posting on our chat And uh, uh, there you can uh, uh, look at this video contributes. So the page is on disruptionlab.org slash evicted minus videos. And there you will find the longer contributes from Christopher Emanuel. And then in the course of this conference, we will also upload the video contributes of all the other people that have been participating. So this is an additional resources that we are giving. Uh, but now there are many questions for you, <laughs> so I'm trying to select them a bit, and I read uh, four of them. Uh, also, just for letting you know, we are also publishing them in our chat, so you can also follow them there. So the first question is, uh, why are cooperatives not always the best for the city? This is a question for Christoph. Uh, then there is a question uh, uh, for Manuel. Uh, how do you think the consequences of an explosion of the housing bubble would look like uh, also in terms of affordability and availability of housing? Will this represent a blast or rather an opportunity for the business of opportunistic funds? Then one again for Christoph, what about the so-called renovations, uh, renovation as excuse to evict tenants? Uh, are they common in berlin i would say i know about that because we our apartment is also owned by achelius they often do that so maybe you want to say something more christoph and then uh, uh, there is another question for both the speakers what would be an ideal ownership structure per percentage wise in your opinion 
And finally, the last one that I suppose is for Christoph, uh, can you assess the effect of meat and decal on Berlin's housing market? Did it show, slow down speculation? So these are the questions. And then you are, uh, I mean, you can also read them in our internal chat, just a little advice to you if you got a bit lost, otherwise I can repeat some, but please uh, uh, you can, uh, start answering and then uh, Eka you can comment with them and we go on with the discussion until the end first you question was about the cooperatives <laughs> yes first yeah. question was to Krista about the cooperatives why why don't you like them so I did I didn't say I don't like them and uh, so they are always part of the solution and uh, if you if you saw on the slides they're part of the green area um, because they don't participate in the speculation um, uh, but uh, we had some particular problems with the cooperatives that were very fighting very very strongly against the meat and decker here in Berlin um, and uh, actually not um, not having the the good of the whole city in mind but mainly the good of themselves and their tenants and I think that's the central problem, so cooperatives are good because they um, give uh, people access to housing, to ownership, and they share this ownership among a group of people. Um, but on the other hand, this group of people is always limited. So it's a very strong insider-outsider problem. Uh, people inside the co cooperative and very often also just the manager who has very strong control about the corporate or inside the cooperative, they determine what happens and not a uh, democratic process, right? So there are some very democratic cooperatives. There are some that are less cooperative, uh, democratic, uh, and it's not a problem with corpor cooperatives per se. Um, they, I really like the idea, and I think very often they are a big and important part of the solution. Um, but uh, my warning is that they might not always um, uh, be as democratic uh, as um, they might uh, might look on from the outside thank you for clarifying the next question was uh, to manuel about the mm -hmm. uh, possible and potential burst of the housing bubble what it would look like and what it would do to uh, the availability and affordability of housing i think it's a strong problem for the investment funds at least as le at least in in spain they have a strong problem because they are in the middle of a lot of operations and they are not going to earn the money they suppose so i think it's a strong problem but having said that the, since they control the banks and also they can sway the politics of the european union you remember mario draghi was a politic of goldman sachs they, they managed to strive in this in this situation they will obtain a lot of free money with zero or negative interest, and they will survive. Like they survived the former crisis with the Obama, this is the case of, of Cerberus. And I think in the, at this point, I think it's a, it's a problem. It could be also an opportunity for their investment funds, but now they are in the middle of the, in the situation. So not, not so easy for them. One proof or maybe one clue of that is that uh, Cerberus have contracted, they usually contract politics to, to make their business before doing the business, uh, and they have contracted here in Spain an energy, a politics very close to energy. He was uh, a politician which managed the Spanish market of energy. So I think they are moving to more safe investments such as energy, the, the pay is fixed to try to give back the money to the pension funds. They are in that kind of strategies because they don't make the investment with their own money usually, maybe it's just the 10%, the rest of the money came from the banks, the most, most of them are from investment funds they have created, so they have to give back the money. So not so easy for them. And in, with affordability here in Spain, uh, the, the, um, the prices will, will low but also the wages, it's quite probable. Uh, we will see, there's a lot of issues here with the coronavirus crisis, but I think the, the prices of the housing market will low for sure here in Spain. The the amount, I don't know how much, but I think it, it will low, but, but also the wages. 
Christoph, would you like to add anything to that? If you think uh, coronavirus uh, will have an impact also on the Berlin housing market, you to, to some extent you already said that you uh, didn't haven't observed any change in the price pricing, um, but perhaps there's anything else on the side of the investment uh, funds. No, I, um, I think. Um, something is happening in berlin and something is going to change and something has to change and um going to be very difficult in the for the for the researchers unfortunately um to get very clear signals because the corona crisis and the rent cap were basically happening at the same time uh, so you will have very much overlapping effect and if you look at it retrospectively researchers will have a problem to say what happened because of corona what happened because of the rent cap and what happened because speculation had reached an end and a roadblock anyway. I think we have those three effects coming together and something that uh, that needs to change in Berlin. Um, and at the moment, simply nothing is happening. Prices, rent prices and house prices just continue as they did. Uh, but the explosion is also um, awaiting in Berlin. <laughs> Uh, you already mentioned that uh, evictions based on uh, on the grounds of renovations in Berlin, uh, there's a law that allows to, um, uh, landlords uh, to evict tenants uh, or increase or increase prices, uh, or then it is subsequent if they're unable to pay uh, increased uh, prices uh, to evict them. Uh, the question from the audience uh, relates to the extent of the problem, to what, how often and how, how frequent and how common it is, is this practice? So I'll, let, let me take this question together with the last one and the final one, because that's that's actually the roadblock that investors were facing anyway in Berlin. So we we come from a very regulated housing market where we have unlimited rent contracts um, and where we have very strong, uh, in theory at least, limits to how you can increase the rent. So you cannot, an existing rent contract, you can only increase by 5% every year, basically. So it takes very long uh, to get from the very low rents of three, four, five euros per square meter in Berlin to the level where investors are. Right? So we have very strong regulation and re regulation always uh, triggers avoidance. And renovations is one, one way to avoid the regulation of unlimited contracts and uh, low rent increases, uh, rent freezes. And for that, it has been very, very common in Berlin, one of the most uh, typical investment strategy um, to renovate and to use renovation to increase rents that the current tenants can't afford anymore. And Achilles, uh, Tatiana has mentioned them, is one of the companies that made this their prime business model. So they buy a house with rents of five or six euros. They bring it to a top class standard, how they would call it, and then rent it for 15 or 20 euros, um, but to different people because the people who lived there before can't, uh, can't afford, right? Uh, but this sort of strategy has faced the roadblock, so the, uh, these renovations are in theory not possible with the Mietendeckel, and even there is a chance that those renovated apartments that you're renting out for 15, 20 euros actually have to go back and cut their rents to the average of seven or eight. Right? So Achelius is facing the possibility that in September, they will have to rent all the fancy apartments that they renovated in the past and are renting for 20 euros uh, and lower the rent to seven euros or eight euros, right? So that's that's the situation we had in Berlin uh, with the Mietendeckel and that's what we had before Corona um, with a lot of potential to change things. Um, at the moment, people just don't follow the meet and, uh, the rent cap, the Mietendeckel and just continue renting out 14, 15 euros Achelius makes parallel contracts, so they give one contract at seven euro, but says whenever we get rid of this stupid regulation, you'll go back to 20 euros immediately. Um, and uh, all of them are thinking how to get out, right? A lot of the investment funds and the investors made a lot of money from the price increases and the strategies that they used in the past, uh, and they want to cash in and leave. And I think that's the point where we're going to see whether Corona work had an effect on that strategies uh, to work uh, and whether they manage to leave with all the profits that they expect, uh, whether the rents are going to climb to 20 euros to pay for their house or the prices continue to increase. 
or they find stupid individuals buying the apartments for high prices. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, basically what we're heading to. And uh, nothing of it is visible yet. Um, we'll see. Let's uh, have Manuel address the next question, which is a very interesting, but also probably a very tough question to answer. If you can uh, discuss an ideal ownership structure in terms of percentages, that would be wise for Spain. Manuel. I, I think uh, the main question here is how much money of uh, the percentage of income that people must expend in their in their housing. For instance, the the aim of the the Vienna the Vienna Town Hall it was uh, spending the 25 percent as much as the 25 percent low than than this percentage. Here in Spain, it's now very often to spend the 60 percent, 50 percent. So I I think it doesn't have to do so much with the ownership the structure and uh, as as the goal do you want to to get in this point i think it's very important the public housing for me because it's the best way to control the the prices it, it has been demonstrated during this these last decades that the countries with a strong tenant regulation the, like such as germany with a uh, non-term contract, indefinite contract, have in fact a strong raises in the in the price of of rent. On the other hand, in Vienna, it could have been controlled. So I think it's much more effective the public housing than any other measure. But uh, for me, it would be the the main measure. And I think it would be wise to use some cities, some examples of of success, such as Vienna or Amsterdam in some way. To, to as an objective for the Spanish cities. We don't have to invent nothing. We have just to see uh, what has worked in, in other countries, in other situations which are similar, uh, big cities, metro. And I think it would be a wise uh, approach to the question. But um, at least I think 25% of public housing and 25% of, of rent at least would be would be a wise model. Um, maybe How about you? if I can if I can contradict a bit, I think um, the the ideal ownership structure is hundred percent of the land owned publicly, right? So because we don't want any private person to uh, extract artificial rents from the land that the houses is built on, because no one ever worked for that land and no one uh, should have a right to the rents from the land, but the public, right? And then the question of what is a good structure of who should manage the houses that are built on that land uh, with contracts made, like for example, 100 year contracts made with the city or the country with a public land, right? You get a right for 100 years to use this public land. And then we can, we can see it depends very much on your taste Sometimes actually public housing companies are not the best managers. Um, and then we will, and maybe some private people um, can be more creative, more flexible. Uh, also you want some private investors, but always on public land with uh, public conditions and the uh, actually the rent, the, the land uh, that is extracted from the um, land should be public. Um, and just to go back to the first question, cooperatives should definitely uh, have a share uh, and a bigger share than they have now. Um, but I think we will still need, even if we have many cooperatives uh, having nice uh, communities, building nice communities in the city, we'll still need some public housing uh, for those that are left out, uh, the, the foreigners, poor people that are not accepted into those uh, usually somewhat homogeneous uh, insider communities of the cooperative and that would struggle to find a place uh, and need public housing and public support uh, to cope with life. I believe uh, one of the keynote uh, speakers, Leila Nifarha, will also be talking about uh, these kinds of solutions, um, uh, I think tomorrow, I believe tomorrow. So it, I'm also looking forward to uh, hearing how her thoughts uh, kind of differ from yours or or, or perhaps maybe match. Yeah, we will be 15 minutes to the class. 
Can you hear me? I think so. Uh, yeah, there was we a little sound questions. disruption. Sorry, apologies. Um, Tatiana, do we have more questions from the audience? Um, I'm looking... No worries if not. I mean, there was a long question from Manuel, I would say. We are basically in time now. We just uh, can finish with this long question. Uh, we take it and then perhaps also, uh, um, yeah, Christoph also could uh, comment and finish. But we, I would say, not more than two minutes because we, are, we have to be very precise. So for Manuel, uh, there was... Um, uh, the assets that uh, were bought by Cerberus from the banks, uh, the banks own those assets as loans. Is it known who uh, those lands belong to before Cerberus brought these assets? Um, yes, or something a bit yes. technical. Yes, in fact, we have to, to talk here about the semi-public saving banks of Spain, which were into bankruptcy, have disappeared, and it was the 50% of the financial market. And just four banks have inherited all that savings banks, and one of them is the BBVA. And they, they inherit, in this case, the, um, the houses of Caixa Catalunya, the former semi-public saving banks of Catalunya. And that, that house came from developers who have also disappeared um like the, the main developers um, such as i will say some names colonial for instance um also it's the same situation with our saving banks the bank sabadell another bank of barcelona and cerberus is this a similar operation from two billion financed by Deutsche Bank is the same operation both in barcelona and that houses came from the operation of the former savings the spanish banks Yes, so I would say, uh, Christoph, if you have a last uh, uh, reflection for this panel, uh, then uh, after that I would uh, close it and uh, we need to have a little break before the next. Well, I think I, I don't want to water down my demand that I made uh, as an answer to the last question. So I think the ideal solution actually would be uh, to move towards much, much more um, limitation to the private rents that can be extracted from housing and to make uh, land uh, publicly owned uh, to create ownership, transparency, to, to create transparency of who owns the cities, um, to be able to regulate and impose uh, the society's conditions on uh, who can earn money with, uh, with our houses and uh, our right to housing. And thank and, you, Chris. Uh, I would just add to that. To... Yes, say. I would just add to that that luckily we have uh, wonderful researchers and activists like yourself uh, paving the way, and uh, it's been such a pleasure to hear from you. And uh, I'm sure members of the audience appreciated your presentations as well. Uh, best of luck with your uh, future research and uh, activism. Yes, I also wanted to mention that we will come back with Christoph on Sunday uh, because we are planning with him a virtual tour around the cities of Berlin uh, from uh, five on, in which we will visit uh, different neighborhoods uh, uh, and discuss uh, the anonymous owners, who owns our city and what we can also do to fight this. And then we'll also have uh, a real physical tour with him uh, we are planning it the 30th of August, so hopefully it will all still be possible, just for the people that live in Berlin, otherwise for all the other people that don't live in town, but also that are in town and want to uh, listen to uh, the um, uh, tour, uh, I suggest also to come back with us on Sunday afternoon and with Christoph, and we did a really a complex editorial project all together, also filming different areas of Berlin and discussing with him uh, uh, what is uh, concretely happening in our city. So uh, please also remember to come back on Sunday and remember to watch the videos of the contributes of Christoph and Manuel that are in details about their researches. So you can find them on our website uh, uh, as we already uh, suggested before. 
And uh, so I want to thank uh, all of you. Thank you, Eka, for this uh, great moderation and for the collaboration with Transparency International. And uh, also thank you, uh, Christoph. Thank you, Manuel. And we will come back uh, all together at six uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, tax events and corruption between uh, London and Dubai. Thank you very much and uh, uh, see you in half an hour. Thank you all.